We now know that vaccination is the only sustainable route out of the pandemic. Yet, there's a gross inequity in vaccine distribution around the world. The WHO has recently warned the COVAX, its vaccine sharing program is running out of supplies. COVAX has delivered 90 million doses to 131 countries, but more than half of eligible countries do not have sufficient supplies and some have run out altogether. Africa especially is in a difficult situation as cases surge across the continent, less than 2% of the population have been vaccinated. To quote the Director General of the WHO, the number of doses administered globally so far would have been enough to cover all health workers and older people if they had been distributed equitably. We could have been in a much better situation. In this webinar, Jayati Ghosh makes a provocative and important argument. By temporarily waiving intellectual property rights and promoting transfer of knowledge and technology to enable public production of the vaccine, the supply issue could have been alleviated. As it stands, the patent system may be delaying the end of the pandemic and protecting the profits of pharmaceutical companies. Jayati Ghosh is Professor of Economics at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, US. She's taught economics at Jahalanand University, New Delhi for nearly 35 years. She has authored or edited 20 books, including The Making of a Catastrophe, COVID-19 in the Indian Economy, which is forthcoming this year, published by Aleph Books. Never done in poorly paid women's work in globalizing India, Women Unlimited, New Delhi 2009. She has co-edited the Elgar Handbook of Alternate Theories of Economic Development, 2014. She's also published a book on the women's work, women workers in the informal economy, which is also forthcoming, published by Routledge, and nearly 200 scholarly articles. In 2021, Jayati was appointed the WHO's Council on the Economics of Health for All, chaired by Mariana Mazzucato. Very pleased to have Jayati providing the, the seminar webinar today. He also is a commentator who is a leading scholar on the global and cross-national cross politics intellectual property. Ken Shadlin is a professor of development studies in the Department of International Development at LSE. In fact, in his book, Coalitions and Compliance, the political economy of pharmaceutical patents in Latin America can analyze this differences in how countries introduced pharmaceutical patents in the 1990s and subsequently revised these patents in the 2000s. So very relevant for the current discussion. Now to a few logistical issues. Please type in your questions using the Q&A feature that you see on your screen. I will read out the questions on your behalf. The webinar will be recorded and shared later on our YouTube channel afterwards. I would now like to invite Jayati to present the webinar. Jayati, over to you, thanks. Thank you very much, Kunal. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm not going to waste more time. Let's just go straight into the issue. Uh, as you can see, the topic is already mentioned. Let's just begin with some background on this pandemic. Of course, we've had endless discussions and analyses of it already, but I think there's one particular aspect that is not often noted so much, which is the background that in the first wave, the North was disproportionately affected. I say this because this is unlike previous epidemics, previous recent epidemics, such as you know, Ebola, the H1N1, the uh, um, SARS, MERS virus, and so on, which dominantly affected developing countries and Asia and Africa. By contrast, this one, uh, although it began in China, it really affected Western Europe and the North America much more dramatically. And I would argue that the pattern of policy response is very significantly affected by that. The design, which is to say containment through lockdowns, through restriction of mobility and economic activity, through what is called social distancing, more correctly, physical distancing of people, et cetera. These are really designed for developed economies. Uh, as Kunal would know, and I'm sure many of the listeners would know, in most developing countries, especially in highly congested urban slums, and even in many rural parts, this is really not possible. You cannot do physical distancing because living and working conditions simply don't now allow it. More than 70% of workers across the developing world are informal, that is without legal and social protection. And so imposing lockdowns that prevent them from earning their livelihood actually requires very dramatic increases in social protection, which is often fiscally impossible for them to do. So this is really a, a strategy that is designed for developed countries. 
I would also like to mention the urgency of the global response with vaccine development. We had a dramatic uh, stepping up, and I'll come back to that in a minute. We had a dramatic stepping up in terms of both public investment and public uh, support for vaccine development, unlike anything we saw in the previous epidemics. And so therefore the nature of this global policy response reflects global inequality and power imbalances already. Uh, my friend, the economist S. Subramanian from MIDS uh, has actually pointed out that this shows how some viruses are more equal than others. But what we do find therefore is that the pattern of response has reflected inequality, but it's also added to those. So as a result of the fact that the first wave affected Northern Europe and North America very sharply, even today, that is rather yesterday, the cumulative deaths per population are the highest in these regions. And now Latin America is rapidly catching up. Uh, the number of deaths in India is widely known to be an undercount. The most recent estimates from Uttar Pradesh from the detailed district level data suggest that the undercount is anywhere between 14 to 55 times the official count. So I think if we had the actual numbers for India, we would find India also in the very dark spot in this map. But nonetheless, you can see that you know, the deaths per population still are relatively concentrated in the Western Hemisphere and in Northern Europe. On the other hand, we also know that this pandemic operates in waves. And what we found, therefore, is that certain waves, uh, the Indian wave is now rising and has just come down again. Brazil is on, it appears to be the third wave. The United States had a major second wave that actually led to dramatic increases, but we are now in a phase of apparent decline in some countries, largely because of vaccination. I think this is a point that Kunal had already made. Brazil, it's still rising, and India, we don't know, everybody is anticipating a third wave, but it, given the slow pace of vaccination, it could well be India also. Now, why did this happen? Essentially, we know that the only way we will control this pandemic eventually is to vaccinate at least 70, maybe 75% of the population. And yet we find that the way vaccines have been produced and distributed has become a major star, uh, stark reminder of the nature of the inequality. And that has several aspects. There's a vaccine grab by rich countries. There's the protection of intellectual property rights uh, of the pharma companies, big pharma, if you like, by rich country governments. Vaccine distribution has reflected extreme nationalism, but also the use of soft power diplomatically. I'll come to that. Now, all of this is rather bizarre because, you know, we realize now, and surely the last year and a half should have made us realize even more, that a pandemic will not be overcome unless it is overcome everywhere. And as long as there are people contracting this disease, uh, we are not going to be safe, even with vaccination. It's also the problem that mutations of the virus are much more likely, especially with large unvaccinated populations, and they affect economic prospects in both the developed and the developing countries. We have the Delta Plus variant in India, it's the double mutant, and there have been recent concerns that this is actually not just more infectious and more fatal, but less likely to be impacted by vaccination. So we've just been lucky so far that the current vaccines, including the mRNA vaccines, are able to control the uh, disease despite the new mutants, but these are continuing to mutate. We cannot be sure that this will occur in future. So here's the vaccine apartheid for you. The share of people who have received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, as, as you can see, among the developing countries, it's really only Chile, and China, Mongolia, that are uh, you know, reasonably up there in terms of the, uh, the kind of vaccination that they have been able to do. Uh, and this reflects the kinds of inequality, the forces that I had mentioned earlier. There are many parts of Africa where not even a single dose has been provided. And as Kunal mentioned, for the continent as a whole, only 2%, less than 2%, have been vaccinated at all. This is just one dose. This is not full protection. 
it's a very much, it's a north-south divide, global north and global south, obviously, other than, as I mentioned, China and Chile. Incidentally, both countries have benefited from the Chinese vaccine, Sinopharm and Sinovac. If you look at the share of people, now this gives you both the single and double dose. And uh, the United Kingdom and Israel and Chile are at the top of the list in terms of the proportion of the population reaching levels of herd immunity, supposedly, except that in the United Kingdom, we still find concerns about mutant variants, and they're still in semi-lockdown for various reasons. But once again, you will see that uh, this is only the countries for which you can get the division between second and, and first dose. You can see that there's a combination of things going on. There is, of course, availability, which is the major restriction for most of the developing world. But there's also vaccine hesitancy. and uh, this is very strong in some countries. You will see in Russia, where they produce their own vaccine, that they have been unable to persuade a large part of their population to actually go in for vaccination. And we find vaccine hes hesitancy even in the United States, where I'm based at the moment, where the vaccination program has just plateaued. It's just stopped mainly because a very significant proportion of adults is unwilling to get themselves vaccinated. So, what are the constraints? What's the problem? Well, fundamentally, the most basic pro problem globally is that there isn't enough. Okay? There's an inadequacy of supply because production is not sufficient. And then, of course, the distribution is skewed because of vaccine grabbing by rich nations. The internal distribution is also messy and in many states incompetent. Uh, even when they have vaccines, they've not been able necessarily to distribute them either equally. Often it reflects internal inequalities and discrimination and power imbalances as well. And I have already mentioned the vaccine hesitancy. Now, this wasn't supposed to happen. As early as March 2020, there were discussions about how we can prevent this. And the COVAX, which is the COVID-19 Vaccines Global Access Facility. It's part of something called the ACT Accelerator. WHO, the World Health Organization, created something called Access to COVID-19 Tools, which, uh, and COVAX is one of the elements of it. That's the one that's supposed to distribute vaccines. And there's another part of it which is supposed to share technology, but we'll come to that. Now, COVAX was created specifically to prevent hoarding by rich country governments and ensure vaccines, uh, vaccines to everybody, especially the world's poor. By mid-2021, that is now, we have it has 190 countries, so most of the world's population. The Trump administration had stayed out of COVAX, uh, Biden joined it in February, uh, so pretty much all the major important countries had joined it. So what's the idea? The idea is that the member countries all can access vaccines by the richer and middle income countries would pay for their doses and would contribute to a fund. That fund would then enable the 92 low income countries to receive free doses. And the idea was that there would be a sort of needs based distribution. First, 3% of the population that's essential health workers and extremely vulnerable. Then 20%, which covers older age groups and the next more vulnerable. Then focus on areas that are very vulnerable because the epidemic is spreading rapidly and people who are more likely. And then finally, all of the country's population. The problem is that this, uh, you know, COVAX is hugely underfunded. The estimate was about 24 billion would be required at least in the first year and a half, only 5 billion has been raised. And as could I mentioned, COVAX has not been able to purchase vaccines as required. And so therefore, it's it's not just that it's underfunded, but it hasn't even able, been able to buy vaccines. And why? Because there was a major design flaw in COVAX, which was that it did not prevent bilateral deals between vaccine companies and governments. Now, there is a problem that the COVAX pricing itself is not transparent. But the, this, the second design flaw is actually the biggest and most significant, because what we found is that governments, especially in the developed world, basically sought out their big pharma or other countries' big pharma and did deals. So within a month of the regulatory approval for the Pfizer-BioNTech and the Moderna and AstraZeneca vaccines, which really happened in 
between early October and mid-November. Advanced country governments that account for only 14% of the world's people had booked 85% of the production for this year. We had 44 bilateral deals in 2020, another 20 that I know of already signed this year, possibly there are more. We don't know because these are all opaque. And of course, the greed was enormous. It's like those, you know, those little bully boys at children's birthday parties who go and grab all the cake. So Canada booked vaccines more than 10 times its population. The US more than four times its population. Now, of course, as I mentioned, nonetheless, there's incompetent internal distribution. But we know that the pricing is much higher than for COVAX, uh, even though we don't have full details of all the deals. And that's really why these COVAX, one of the big reasons is that COVAX has not been able to buy. Even with money, it's not been able to buy because the orders have already been, the deals have been done. Massive variations in the price, anywhere from $2.19 to $40 per dose. I think Israel paid one of the highest rates. Uh, there's a, a, one estimate that some doses were even $72. But what is remarkable is that some developing countries are often paying more than developed countries. The AstraZeneca vaccine, which was supposed to be a completely non-profit thing, $5.25 in South Africa, $3.50 in the European Union. So what we have now today, 75% of vaccines have gone to just 10 countries. And these same countries are now sitting on these large stockpiles of vaccines. The US has 80 million AstraZeneca, which it's never going to use because it's really only using uh, Pfizer, Moderna, and the Johnson & Johnson vaccines. And these may soon become unusable. The G7's recent meeting for a lot of hopes, what did they pledge? 870 million doses, it's a joke. It's a, not, it's a tiny little drop in the ocean, and that to only half of that by the end of this year in the next six months. So it's nowhere near what we need. And of course, the pace is too slow. Uh, 25 million doses only in Africa with a population of 1.36 billion. And what is really obscene is that some of the vaccines that were delivered as charity to African countries were close to expiration dates. They had to be destroyed. So if we want to get global herd immunity, we're not gonna get it till late 2024. The distribution is of course one sign of the inequality, but the basic reason is that vaccine supply is limited. And that's because the vaccines that have been approved by WHO in particular, have really all of them have got patent rights that give the pharma companies monopoly on production. And that really means that they will produce only what their own capacity enables and the few production licenses that they choose to issue to others. Now, remember, patents are supposed to reward innovation. But already we have seen that Big Pharma, in this case, got massive government subsidies. This is part of the policy response that I had mentioned earlier. In the US, $12 billion to just six companies and possibly more to others. And that more than covered the R&D costs. In addition, they did pre-sales, right? So they have already got very big profits. The R mRNA vaccines use significant amounts of prior public research. The, it's only the last mile development that was done by these two companies. And that too, as I mentioned, was publicly funded. The AstraZeneca vaccine was developed 97% with public funds by in Oxford University in a public lab. Uh, it was originally intended to be open. They were going to put all the data, everything up on the website. Uh, the Gates Foundation, which is a major funder of Oxford University, moved in and persuaded them to shift entirely to a singular deal with AstraZeneca, which now holds the patent. Now, the other problem is that it's not even as if Big Pharma then uses the profits for R&D. It doesn't. Uh, the R&D spending is relatively low compared to other spending. Pfizer, for example, which is estimated to get 24 billion, according to its report to its shareholders this year. Last uh, few years, it spent 139 billion on share buybacks and dividends, and only 82 billion on R&D. So there are some ways in which we can get around this. And one of the most basic requirements is a waiver on the TRIPS rules on patenting. So the WTO uh, 
trade-related intellectual property rights agreement or TRIPS, uh, is the one that is preventing governments from issuing li production licenses to more and more companies, okay? So in October last year, India and South Africa requested a waiver. They said, allow all the countries to not enforce patents and other IPRs on not just the vaccines, but on drugs, diagnostics, the testing, all the things that we need to deal with this pandemic until we get global herd immunity. Now, this is obvious. It's been done before. It's, the Second World War is a period when patents were suspended, many other emergencies. And the trip says explicitly that there are emergency conditions, there are exceptional circumstances where these patent rights and other intellectual properties should be suspended. So it's a very limited request. All it says is that we are not going to face cases in WTO if we give other producers compulsory licenses, if we distribute the information, if we actually allow, enable other producers. Despite this very limited request, this has been repeatedly blocked in the TRIPS Council by the advanced countries. Uh, surprising because this would also benefit their own populations. It would make vaccines available globally much more quickly and larger supply would reduce the costs. So it would even make it cheaper for governments and taxpayers. Very recently, last month, the Biden administration agreed. It was one of the major opposers, and it has now agreed to stop blocking the TRIPS waiver. But if you look at the map of the countries, other than uh, the US, it's really, a, once again, a north-south divide. Brazil is an outlier, but then, you know, Bolsonaro, uh, well, okay, uh, that, that explains the Brazil outlier. But largely, it's once again a north-south divide in terms of the TRIPS waiver for medical tools. Now, some have argued that you don't need that because a, a, a government can just issue a compulsory license. Now, what's that? That is when a, a government gives the authorization to produce to a third party. And uh, it's supposed to happen because you want to prevent monopolistic behavior and during public health emergencies. There is actually a TRIPS agreement uh, the Doha Declaration on TRIPS and Public Health. But it's also true that in the just TRIPS, there are some free trade agreements, bilateral investment treaties, economic partnership agreements that also prevent compulsory licensing. But why is the TRIPS waiver important? Because, you know, many of these vaccines, the production is not just that, oh, I'm going to produce the Moderna vaccine, so I will take that license. Because the process is very complicated, and there are many other patents that you have to get the approval for. Are, it's estimated between 60 and 64 approvals required in the process. So it would be a nightmare for new producers unless you had a waiver. But remember that this is just the legal condition. This is an enabling condition that says you're not going to face cases. The transfer of technology is not compulsory. And it's true that when you ask for a patent, you have to provide a lot of data. But it's been argued that because some of these vaccines are quite complicated to produce, the data provided during the approval process is not necessarily enough to enable other production. So what we really need, this is just the first step, we really need the transfer of technology. It's urgent and it has to happen. Now, the point is there are existing producers in many countries. They have a state of art facilities and these are countries as far apart as you know, Canada and Bangladesh. They have, uh, they're willing, some have even applied for licenses and been denied. The WHO has got a list of more than 200 companies that are willing and able to produce vaccines, including the mRNA vaccines. And, you know, there's a very, how shall I put it, sort of currently colonial argument that has been made even by Bill Gates and others that, oh, you know, these poor countries, they don't have uh, the ability to produce the vaccine. So we can't just let any old person produce it. We have to make sure that it's under the right conditions. Bear in mind that most of the vaccines in the world were actually produced in the developing world uh, until this particular pandemic. So, in fact, this technology can be shared. Governments can push the companies that have received significant public funding, which is, let's say, all of them, to share the technology. Uh, the Biden government already did this for Johnson & Johnson. It said, share your technology or, uh, uh, with Merck so that you have more production. And they did that. So if they can do that within the country, they can also do that for the CTAP, the COVID-19 Technology Access Pool of the WHO, which is another part of the ACT Accelerator. 
it's absolutely ex uh, essential to build up manufacturing capacity across the world. There are systemic risks. Uh, you have to actually make sure that there is a sub basic supply of essential pharmaceuticals at the local levels. Now, it's true, these are global health commons, this is a global pandemic, but unfortunately, the very nationalistic current experience, and it's been nationalistic at many levels, countries have banned exports, like India suddenly banning the exports, when it realized, the Modi government realized what a mess it had made of its own vaccine policy. But within Europe, we've seen that, I mean, there are, uh, the, many countries are now forced to think regionally, nationally, locally. The point is that this is going to be critical even in future pandemics and health threats. We don't know in advance which vaccines and treatments will be necessary. It's going to be more important to invest in a range of assets. Countries that are being denied today are going to do their best to set up new technologies. Final aspect I just want to mention is the regulatory approval. Now, because of the speed of this response, we've had the fastest approval ever for vaccines, the fastest development R&D and the fastest approval. Normally vaccines are approved after five, six years because you'll take account of all of the possibilities. These, all of them, every single one of them have got only emergency authorization. There are other vaccine candidates. Vaccines have developed two in China, one Sputnik V in Russia. The Cuban one is apparently very promising and is in stage three trials. India has got its own vaccine, uh, but the WHO approval process is skewed in favor of companies based in the developed world. It has a list of stringent regulatory authorities and guess where they are? In Europe, US, Canada, Australia, Japan. Every other country, the vaccine producers have to go through pre-qualification, which is very complicated, bureaucrat bureaucratic, extended, takes at least six months. So Sinovac and Sinopharm applied before the well-known Western vaccines. Sputnik applied before. Sinopharm and Sinovac just got approved. Sputnik is not yet approved. The Pfizer BioNTech vaccine was approved within three weeks because WHO worked with the European Medical Agency. So these are also inequalities that need to be addressed. WHO also needs to get its act together. Uh, Kunal mentioned that I'm on a WHO Council for the Economics for Health for All. And we have made, uh, very recently, we brought out a position paper and uh, on the use of technology and on basically on innovation, medical innovation and how to govern it. And we have a number of key recommendations. The first most urgent is that the countries that are sitting on available doses should immediately redistribute. Everyone that has vaccinated more than 20% of their population should redistribute with a significant proportion of the doses going to COVAX. That's still not the case, even with the US, even G7, those grandiose announcements amount to very little. We have to waive the IPRs, uh, basically to get rid of the legal barriers. And that's essential because without that, that's, you know, uh, there are too many complications and countries, uh, governments can face all kinds of cases and investor state disputes from pharma companies. We need technology transfer. I've already talked about that. Uh, and we need supply chain resilience. There is also nationalism in terms of the raw materials and intermediate goods. The Biden government is still preventing the export of essential raw materials and intermediates required for vaccines and therapies. And this is true across the world. So we need much greater focus on supply chain resilience, but we also need to diversify manufacturing. We need to expand manufacturing to all regions, to better respond and to sort of establish end-to-end -end pandemic preparedness. Because let's not kid ourselves, this is not the end. This may just be the beginning, we have to be prepared. So I think that's it. Let me get Thank back. You, Jackie, thanks so much. Um, I mean, the WHO Council recommendation that you're a member of provides really clear action steps, steps that global community can take to do something right away, isn't it? And that's something we can back to the Q&A. Um, now very well, uh, very pleased to ask, uh, to invite Ken Shadlin to, to provide his comments. And Ken, of course, has been working on pharmaceutical patents for a long time. Ken, go ahead, please. Okay, great. Um, th thank you, Jati, for a, such a nice presentation, a real tour de force. Um, you covered so many important issues and di different dimensions of the crisis. It was great. It's an honor to be asked 
to discuss this. Uh, so thanks for that. And also thank you, Kunal, and the UNU wider team for inviting me and giving me this chance. I want to start by underscoring a couple of Jayati's key points about the COVID response. And then I'm going to move to a few comments about the immediate situation we're in now, uh, where I don't think there's very much water between us, but there might be a little bit. Um, and hopefully this will be, give us some material for a nice discussion and I'll, I'll do my best to finish by 1.40 within 10 minutes. Uh, so just to start, I mean, as Jayati said, there's no question that the response in 2020 was urgent and impressive, uh, but there's also no question that it lacked sufficient attention to global diffusion and access issues. I mean, one way to think about this specifically is that there was a, there was a heavy focus on diffusion within countries. So for example, in, you know, the US, in the US, vaccines are free. Drugs aren't usually free in the US. Um, and there's massive campaigns to get the vaccines out and to you know, governments focusing on distribution in ways that they don't normally care about. Uh, so access and diffusion was a key part of the campaign within a lot of countries, but just not among countries, as uh, Jayati so nicely illustrated. And I think that this could have probably been done differently. Uh, if you think about sort of some of the, the funding mechanisms uh, could have had as a condition for receiving the funding, the requirement to establish partnerships and global production networks. Um, and sort of the advanced purchases, which were there in some ways just to get in front of the queue, but presumably were there theoretically to sort of incentivize innovation and production, they could have been a lot larger to make enough for the whole world. Um, you know, kind of like what Biden announced last month, where it was like the US is gonna buy a lot of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine for the world, not just for the US, but this could have been done a lot earlier and a lot bigger than the amount of doses that was announced. Um, more generally, I think the national responses, particularly in the US and the UK, were the two, which were the two countries that sort of led the national responses. I know less about what happened in Russia and China. These national responses totally swamped and overwhelmed the global responses. Um, so the same vaccines that the global supporters like CEPI, which wasn't part of Jiazzi's presentation because I don't think she had time to include it, the same vaccines that CEPI were, was supporting, which then should have had some access conditions attached to it, these were also supported by the US and by the UK with a lot more money. And so they imposed their own conditions. And then there's the marginalization of COVAX, as Jayati explained. I want to just make two quick points about COVAX before moving on to production. Um, one is that, and this might sound like a small quibble, but I think it's an important quibble. I think to say that COVAX allowed bilateral deals and to criticize COVAX for allowing bilateral deals that strikes me as a strange and probably unfortunate way to, to put it. I mean, I think COVAX was initially designed very naively as if there wouldn't be bilateral deals, but there were, and COVAX couldn't prevent them. So in the summer of 2020, it was effectively redesigned sort of to accommodate bilateral deals as a fact. Um, I have a lot of trouble imagining how COVAX could have possibly been designed to prevent bilateral deals. Um, I know that they wish they would, could have, but I don't see how that really could have happened. And so the result is, you know, we've seen a vicious cycle. Countries want to, they're willing to pay more to get the vaccines faster. And so they procure doses directly to avoid depending on the supply from COVAX that looks like it might be unstable. And what that does is it creates unreliable, unstable supply from COVAX and so if you're watching that, what you do is you purchase doses directly. And what that does is it creates or reinforces the lack of reliable supply from COVAX. And then as you see that, you say, oh, I better do that. So there's more bilateral purchase and it just goes on and on and on and on. And of course, the obvious point here is that not all countries can engage equally in these bilateral purchasing strategies um, for the reasons that we all understand. The second thing I want to point out, and this was sort of implicit, I think, in Jayati's comments, but I wish it were a bit more explicit, is that COVAX was never going to be about equal access to vaccines. COVAX was about avoiding the worst instances of unequal access to vaccines, essentially where some countries had none. So COVAX's aim was for roughly 20% of the populations in all countries to be vaccinated by the end of 2021. That was the aim. And relative to 
none of the populations being vaccinated by 2021. That's a really big aim. But that's all it was, was 20% of the populations. The fact of the matter is, is that COVAX still might hit that target. It might even exceed that target. I've read like, oh, they might get 25% in most countries. Um, and if they do, it will be celebrated as a major success, but it's only a success on very, very limited terms. I mean, it's sort of an unprecedented success of a global instrument to purchase and distribute vaccines, but it's gonna still leave us with intense distribution problems, as Jayati explains, because 20% doesn't really solve the problem. Um, so I think there are some important lessons here for students and scholars of international political economy, about sort of international institutions and how they can be designed and how they respond to external uh, dyna sort of power dynamics in the global economy. Happy to come back to that uh, if you want in the Q&A. But let's, let's talk about production because we all agree that the distribution problems would be much less acute were production less constrained. I do think we have to acknowledge the production increases. I mean, in a normal year, in the area of 5 billion vaccines are produced for all conditions around the world. In 2021, we're probably gonna have about 10 billion vaccine doses produced just for COVID. Those are rough figures, but that's pretty impressive, right? Now, remember that most of the vaccines for COVID are double dose. So 10 million, billion doses means roughly 5 billion people, but still that's a huge ramping up of production in a very short period of time. Um, and I think that basically it's not enough, but I think we have to ask ourselves how that happened and question sort of how quickly we say that basically the companies aren't producing enough and they're not licensing very much. We've produced, we're producing a ton. It's just not enough. And so we need to be figuring out ways to increase production. And I think the world is paying attention to this now, belatedly, but I think the world is finally paying attention to this now. I'm not as convinced as Jayati is that the TRIPS waiver is the key piece of the puzzle. And the reason why is implicit or explicit in, in this, the last part of Jayati's talk, it needs to be complemented by technology transfer in ways that the TRIPS waiver itself seems like, unlikely to enable. So let me just say uh, sort of parenthetically, this is a very weird moment for me. I've spent my career researching and worrying about TRIPS and the effects of intellectual property and pharmaceuticals, what I and other people call sort of the globalization of pharmaceutical patenting since the 1980s and 90s, sort of worrying about these things. And at the start of the pandemic, when we were all talking about treatments, because that's nobody thought vaccines would be available this fast, I was giving presentations about patent-related problems. I mean, a year ago, we were all talking about remdesivir. And the problem, yeah, and for treatments, particularly sort of normal, small molecule chemical drugs, Removing the IP barriers works to increase production. We saw this with AIDS drugs. We saw this with hep C drugs. We see it with lots of drugs. And there a good case can be made as well for doing it broadly via a TRIPS waiver rather than country by country, product by product with reforms to compulsory licensing rules. We can come back to that as well. I'm less certain about what a TRIPS waiver achieves for increasing the production of COVID vaccines on account of a specific set of challenges, some acknowledged by Jayati, but I don't think all of them were. And the key things are the challenges of replication at scale and doing so without the active transfer of technology and know-how. And when we talk about transfer of technology and know-how, one of the things we're talking about is tacit knowledge, not the stuff that's in the patents, not the stuff that's in the regulatory submissions, not not the, the recipes, as people like to call it, but the stuff that's in the brains of human beings. And that's a lot of what technology transfer entails. You don't just share your documents and your data with me. You send your people to my factory to teach my people how to do this at scale and efficiently and well. One of the things that I've been trying to study during the pandemic is the extent to which technology transfer entails sort of the sharing of codified knowledge and information, documents and data, versus the sharing of non-codified tacit knowledge. Um, and a lot, a lot is riding on that question because the former can be transferred via compulsion. It's much harder, if not impossible, frankly, to compel transfer of the latter. 
the bottom line for me is that we agree that increasing production is the key task. And we agree that there's probably a lot more production capability out there that's not currently being mobilized and tapped into. We can talk about that more. And we also agree that getting more production with more producers requires more than relaxing or removing IP, but also technology transfer. In other words, we agree that the TRIPS waiver is not sufficient. Where I think we probably part ways is I, also, I actually wonder if the TRIPS waiver is not only not sufficient, but even necessary um, for the reasons that I just mentioned. If we can't force the sort of technology transfer that's required, then I'm not really sure what the role of the TRIPS waiver even is here. Quite simply, if the waiver is not enough on its own, if we also need technology transfer from the originators to producers in the global south, we need their active engagement, we need them to send their people, then I'd like us to think about how to increase technology transfer and specifically how the TRIPS waiver is gonna do that. Again, I should be the easiest person in the world to convince given all of my priors on this topic, but I haven't seen an explanation of how the TRIPS waiver is gonna enable these other things to happen the things that we all admit need to happen to complement the waiver. So how's it gonna do it? But I often see as an acknowledgement that technology transfer is important, i.e. market entry won't just happen without removing the IP, and a call for funders to compel it, sort of, hey, look, pharma, you've had a chance to do it your way, but if you're not gonna do it, you know, if it's not gonna happen enough your way, then governments need to make it happen. And the TRIPS waiver is somehow gonna accomplish that. But it's those final two steps that I just haven't seen explained yet, and I want to be discussed more. How the governments can make technology transfer of this sort happen, and what role the TRIPS waiver plays in it. Let me just end by saying there is a broader political point about the TRIPS waiver that I think is worth noting too. And that is essentially using this as an opportunity to rebalance the global rules on intellectual property, to challenge the institutional arrangements that essentially underpin the transnational pharmaceutical sector's power. After all, never has this topic gotten so much attention. I spend my year, my career basically toiling in the corner, you know, an intellectual community of three because nobody really cares about this stuff. Now suddenly everybody cares about this stuff. And hey, if we don't seize this moment and topple the system now, then when will we ever seize the moment and topple the system? It's hard not to find that appealing politically, it's certainly hard to oppose this campaign when you look at the map of countries, for example, that Jayati puts up, but I'm just not sure that's really where our priorities should be right now. I think our priority should be to ending the vaccine apartheid by scaling up production, something like a, call it Operation Warp Speed for the World, and a much greater sharing of doses. Um, and where the TRIPS waiver fits into this for me is something that I'm still unconvinced of. So I'll leave it there. I, and uh, again, thank you, Jayati, for the presentation. And thank you, Kanal, for giving me the chance to speak. Uh, thanks so much, Ken. So I think you know the point here that Ken did you raise is that we all agree that we need to have increased supplies, of course. And we also agree that global production in the South, global South has to, has, to, has to increase. We cannot depend on only US pharmaceutical companies to supply to meet the, to, to meet the supply, demand, uh, supply needs. And whether the trips waiver is either a necessary condition or sufficient condition to get to that objective is the real question here. I can already see some really nice questions in the Q&A. And the first question I see is the one I was going to ask actually anyway. So let me get those questions in. And then maybe Jayati, you can respond to Ken's uh, comments. And then we can have a more of an interactive discussion. So let me see if I can make the, uh, if I can allow the first, um, uh, the question from the audience to be answered, uh, to be asked uh, live. So let me see that's Anna Robel. So Anna, I'm gonna try and see if I can allow you to speak because I think we've got a really interesting question there. So let me just try to do that first. Anna, do you, can you go ahead? I think I've uh, unmuted you. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation. I have a question about the uh, TRIPS uh, com compulsory licensing. Uh, why existing TRIPS regulation on compulsory licensing are not uh, are insufficient to ensure greater vaccine uh, availability? Uh, you had to, you have talked a lot of uh, a lot of uh, about the uh, India's proposal on waiver uh, on. Uh, 
intellectual property, but we have this uh, regulation on compulsory licensing why we do not should use them to uh, to make uh, vaccines more uh, available. Thank you. And there's a question from Arindam Laha. Arindam, do you want to go ahead? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sir, in the context of uh, vaccine, uh, in the context of vaccine access, we have implemented one uh, project like vaccine boitri, and uh, in the uh, and there is a uh, socio-economic and political cost of vaccine diplomacy adopted by the Indian government. The move towards benefiting the humanity by making the vaccine available to the neighbor and our countries become under civil, uh, serious criticism. Actually, we have faced severe criticism from uh, all the corners within the country. So although India is considering to uh, be a largest producer of the vaccine in the world, it is literally struggling up to cope with the huge domestic demand coupled with additional demand on the ground of vaccine diplomacy. So what can be the alternative policy? How uh, can we pri prioritize our domestic needs without compromising the need of the other countries? Hey, thanks so much, Arindam. And Sanjay Reddy is also got a question. Sanjay, I think I've, about, I've been able to unmute you. You want to go ahead? Uh, thank you, Kunal. Um, I wanted to ask Ken uh, about a proposal which um, Arna Bachari and I made in an article in Foreign Policy we wrote, which I would think would fully address your concerns, which is that um, a pharmaceutical company could be paid to actively provide its uh, technology to engage in consultancy services to ensure that the technology was applied in an effective manner on site wherever it was, uh, it was actually implemented. And um, by being provided a sufficient incentive to do so, it would presumably do so. And we have argued that it would be sufficient to have one company do this. One doesn't have to have every company do this. A single company which has a viable vaccine or indeed a single uh, country uh, which has produced such a vaccine. This would provide a global public option which would not only increase supply but also uh, force a lowering of prices in the market as a whole. Why would this not fully address your concerns? I'm not sure that I understand. Well, thanks so much, Sanjay. All right, let's uh, go back to Jaiti and Ken. Jati, first to you, perhaps or maybe also to respond to some of Ken's comments, but also the questions from the audience. Yes. And then Ken, yeah, go ahead. Sure, thank you so much. So, you know, I think let me first clarify a few issues. Um, let's begin with the point. I mean, Ken, honestly, I think you're setting up a straw man. Everybody is agreeing that TRIPS waiver is not sufficient. It is necessary. Why is it necessary? Because as I mentioned of the multiplicity of patents, because every compulsory license has to be granted company to company, item by item. And now given the complexity of vaccine production, that means that there are huge numbers of uh, approvals required even for one vaccine. And it's in each of these could then be contested. There is a history of contestation, which you know better than me. In the WTO, when companies have issued compulsory licenses, they have often had to face cases or largely brought by the US and uh, Switzerland and a bunch of other countries. So in fact, it's not the case that you, know, you can just transfer some technology and get away with it because both are required. In other words, certainly this is not sufficient and nobody is saying it's sufficient, but it is necessary. It's necessary to overcome the legal hurdles for expanding production. The other point, you know, yes, the world is going to meet 25% of uh, population, including in developing countries. Why? Because of China. What we haven't mentioned so far, and I should have, is that China today accounts for more than 50% of the global distribution of vaccines. And it's not just within China. There are many countries in the developing world who are getting vaccines only from China. In fact, if I was cynical, and I am a bit, I would argue that G7 is even responding in the limited, uh, rather pathetic manner that it is, because they're worried that China is extending its influence by providing vaccines. The failure of India to meet its own obligations is one part of that. And the whole attempt of the Quad to set India up as the producer of vaccines for the developing world, vis-a-vis -vis China, because China has doubled its vaccine production capacity in the last uh, few months. 
And pretty soon Chinese vaccines, are, now that both of them have got regulatory approval from the WHO, pretty soon Chinese vaccines are going to take over a large part of the developing world. I think that's a great thing. I think that's wonderful, especially because a lot of it is free. And once the Cuban vaccine actually emerges and some countries have declared they will take it even without regulatory approval, if they can get some other medical agency to actually approve it, uh, we are definitely going to see a ramping up. This is despite uh, the control of IPR, really because so many countries invested in vaccine development in R&D for the vaccine. Why would the TRIPS waiver be important? Nonetheless, even if we're going to get more and more vaccines from China, should we say, no, let's just forget it? No, because this is just the beginning. We know, and that's, I think, the final point I made, and, and it's part of our proposals in the WHO Council, is that this is just one pandemic. We don't know whether this one will persist through mutations or whether we will get new threats, but we do know that the current global system is completely inadequate to actually meet any of these emergency needs. We have to have a system that will enable us to very quickly respond to this, including by getting rid of the legal impediments as well as the knowledge impediments. Uh, I think Anna had a question about the compulsory licensing. I have already partly answered that, that it is, you know, it's really company to company, each company, you have to give the particular transfer from that company to this company for this item. And so it's incredibly complicated. And of course, it's not enough because you don't get the transfer of technology. Once you have a generalized TRIPS waiver, the argument against that is that it will prevent further innovation to which I would respond that we know that the vaccines that are being developed today were not because you know they said, oh, there's a pandemic, let's quickly go and do R&D to get vaccines or drugs or anything. We got these because there was major public intervention, direct support, prior public research, massive public subsidies, advanced purchases. And that's why we got these vaccines so quickly. Uh, so I think there is, a, there is an issue about uh, tacit knowledge. I think that's a very important point you raised. It's not just, you know, I mean, Sanjay is absolutely right. You can pay. But, you know, let's remember compulsory licensing doesn't mean that the company that holds the patent doesn't get any return. A compulsory license is the grant of an ability to produce with a reasonable royalty. And so along with that, you can say, we, we funded your technology. We have handed, I mean, AstraZeneca, in fact, it's really even more obscene. They didn't even do anything. They were just brought in when the thing had been developed and they took over the patent. So we have given you this technology, you share it. And there are enough, we will give you a reasonable return, reasonable, but we will make sure you share it. And I don't think that um, Big Pharma, I mean, of course they can lobby and backdoor channels and all that, but I don't think that Big Pharma will uh, necessarily go completely against governments on whose regulatory approval and continued subsidies, they are hugely reliant. Or in the, uh, the vaccine noitri, you know, let's admit that the Indian vaccine policy is not just a mess, it is an appalling undoing of a very successful universal immunization program that existed in the country for 70 years. And it's an undoing of huge uh, uh, existing public sector infrastructure in drug and vaccine production. There are eight public sector companies that could have produced the vaccine. The Indian government stance, let's admit it, is hypo hypocritical in the WTO because it is demanding a TRIPS waiver in the WTO, but it has not issued compulsory licenses even for the co-vaccine, which is pro domestically produced and was produced with ICMR, with the Indian Council of Medical Research. So the Indian government could have issued compulsory licenses well as soon as co-vaccine was approved by the Indian uh, authorities, it could have then assured that the eight public sector companies that exist and are willing and do have the facilities could be actually mobilized to produce it. And we would have doubled the co-vaccine production easily. In fact, probably quadrupled, quintupled, depending on uh, you know, how much you actually uh, ensure that these producers do. The fact that it hasn't done so is really, I would suggest an indication that of some kind of crony capitalism at work, an attempt to protect one particular private producer. 
So I'm not holding uh, any candle for the Indian government's uh, approach. I think the Indian government's approach of vaccine maitri was definitely good uh, in theory. That the fact that it messed up its own domestic distribution and then reneged on its commitments, on its own aid commitments, as well as on the uh, commitments that the Serum Institute of India had made with AstraZeneca and COVAX, that it forced them to renege. This is all, um, I mean, it was all entirely avoidable. And it is unfortunate that the Indian government's peculiar approach, which is on the one hand trying to, you know, drumbeat India's uh, status as global vaccine producer, which we have now completely undermined, and on the other hand, not even making orders for vaccines domestically, and then putting in extraordinary conditions, first getting state governments to try and buy them separately from across the world, then make, making individuals pay for vaccines, which no other country is doing. All of these, I would say, obscenities of the Indian vaccine policy are extremely unfortunate. Uh, let's just hope that they are all reversed very quickly. Thanks, Jayati, sir. And I think, Ken, did you want to address uh, Sanjay Reddy's specific question? Yeah, but I just want to say that I, I don't, I think that I have been totally misunderstood. It's not, com it's never comfortable to be, to be told that you're arguing against a straw man when the argument is not what you make. My point is simple. You can't compel the transfer of tacit knowledge, period. You can't compel the transfer of tacit knowledge. And if tacit knowledge is important, then you need to figure out a better way to get it from one actor to another. That if you want to, if the tacit knowledge is important and the way you transfer it has to be with the active and willing engagement of the people who have that knowledge. And once you have the active and willing engagement of the people you have that knowledge, then the IP problems go away because they're already actively engaging. So you don't need to get rid of any other IP because the IP is no longer, then the IP is no longer an obstacle. Um, and so for, you need to get the firms to do that. A lot of firms are doing that. They're just not doing enough of it. I agree that they're not doing enough of it. And I want to understand how we could get them to do more of it. Um, but the firms do that. They do it all the time. They transfer tacit knowledge. And in the course of transferring tacit knowledge, the IP issues go away. Sanjay's proposal, I think, is really interesting. I'm skeptical that you could do this through a third party sort of technology transfer facilitator of this sort, because I actually think that you need AZ to do it, you need Moderna to do it, you need Pfizer to do it, and so on. And so I actually think it needs to be done more on a firm to firm basis than on a, than sort of subcontracting it out to a third party one. Um, but it certainly is worth trying, and it would probably have a, it would probably make some improvement in the situation. So if I don't think it would fully address or capitalize uh, the concerns that I've raised, I do think it would basically go a long way towards addressing at least some of them and actually more constructively way toward addressing some of them. I mean, I think that, so I do, I'm sort of, I'm kind of on board with you. I'm on your train. I just don't think it makes the problem go away, go away completely. Um, uh, thanks, uh, Ken. Uh, there's one last question I can take for the audience. A very quick question. What should we ask? Uh, I think you can speak. Uh, I've unmuted you. Hello. Yes, go ahead. Oh, uh, many thanks uh, for the for this uh, insightful discussion. Uh, my question is uh, like uh, on the usage of uh, like if, uh, on your view, your views on the usage of usage and approval of viral vector vaccines vis-a-vis -vis mRNA vaccines. And also, uh, how cost-effective and useful do you think it's to conduct large-scale serological surveys? Firstly, to trace the variants, up, uh, like we have the Delta, Delta Plus, we don't know what next. And subsequently, device vaccination strategy. Will that be useful at all? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Moshimi. So in fact, you know, actually, Jayati, I was going to ask this question because the mRNA vaccines, the protein-based vaccines, have a very different supply chain issue than the virus-based uh, vaccines, right? The older vaccines that we used to have. And there is a complication that, you know, Pfizer needs 280 ingredients. I mean, that's incredible. They are ingredients coming from, from often from other parts of the world. And that, that specific challenge with the mRNA vaccine, now they might not be that much useful in the, especially Pfizer, for example, in, in, in Africa and Asia. But uh, how, how do you uh, address this question that this kind of vaccines 
with the, even with the IPR waiver, it's very complicated because of the complex supply chains that we have with these vaccines. As you already seen already in the, in the case in the US, where we have, as you mentioned, a lot of the ingredients have been not been allowed to be exported to other countries. So very quickly, we got one minute actually. Yeah, sure. No, thank you very much for this. You know, I am not uh, really qualified. I'm not a scientist. However, we do have scientists in the WHO Council, and we are informed that there is ongoing research with the mRNA vaccines, and it's not just the companies, but it's also public research, which is simplifying the process and requiring lower kinds of refrigeration, not the extreme cold chain, but more like, you know, minus 10%, 15%, and that this is actually very promising. So that's one. The, apparently, the, the advantage of mRNA vaccines is not only that they have been proved to be much more effective, but also that they are hugely re reproducible once you have technologies. In other words, the scaling up once you have the processes is much, much easier than it is even for Johnson & Johnson or AstraZeneca. And some of the other adenoviral things, which are apparently, and like Covaxin, which requires a, a much more complicated in-lab process. Now, as I said, I'm not a scientist, so I don't really know. But I, you know, the, the research on this is ongoing. And I repeat, most of this is now being done in public labs. I do believe that by 2022, early 2022, we're going to have a new generation of vaccines and that these will probably be much more easily reproducible, including the mRNA ones. But as I said, the, I'm just talk, I'm repeating what I have been told by people who are actually experts in this field. I, I myself have no expertise. All right. Thanks, Jayati. Just to end very quickly, the one thing that you know that I feel is very important, and this is not just about the IPR waiver issue, is the point that Jayati you made about the fact that how much public subsidies and state funding made a difference with, with this, in this case, right? I mean, prior to this pandemic, 10% uh, of global R&D was spent on the diseases affected 90% of the of the pop world population: malaria, tuberculosis, AIDS, and so on. Right now, we see this huge supply response. To a large extent, as you said, because of the very important uh, funding that's happened uh, from, from Western go governments. And I think the overall message is that how important that is, not only for this particular case, but for the future, because you often forget that. And I think it's an important lesson in development studies that how states can make a difference in this, in this kind of case, because previously that wasn't what we, we saw with previous diseases that are particularly uh, 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 afflicting population in the global south. So that's an important point. The other thing I just think thought that, that was very interesting is the question of the politics of, of vaccine uh, distribution. The point you made about perhaps the G7 response could be because of the way Chinese vaccines are going around in the global south. I think that's really interesting. We're going to see how that plays out. And I think that tells us that you know, there's more to be said about the story, which I think perhaps deserves its own separate webinar, perhaps, because it's really interesting how the G7 uh, responded to this uh, particular issue. And I think that's something I think agree with you that could be in response to what we're seeing happening in the Chinese uh, distribution of their own vaccines in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. So that's a, sort of a very interesting observation. Let me conclude here by thanking both Jayati and Ken for a really interesting discussion, very important issues. I'm so glad that both of you agreed to participate in this webinar. We got some excellent questions too. Thank you so much and hope to see you again in another wider event. And thanks to all to the audience. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.